Hi there, thanks so much for joining for this event. This is the latest in the Philosophy Today series, which is co-hosted by the Philosopher and Boston Review. I'm Anthony Morgan, editor of the Philosopher, and I am delighted that Boston Review have agreed to collaborate with us on this event and five others over the course of this autumn. So just to introduce Boston Review to those of you who may not know about their fantastic work. They're an independent nonprofit public space for the discussion of ideas and culture. They publish several online essays per week on topics such as arts, law, gender and sexuality, race, philosophy, and science, all of it entirely free to access. They also publish four themed print issues a year and the forthcoming autumn issue is called Imagining Global Futures, guest edited by the brilliant political scientist Adam Getachew. Um, it is described as a collection of post-colonial visions for a more just world, and it is available for pre-order now. I'll put details of Boston Review and that um, forthcoming issue in the box below this video. Turning now to today's event, this conversation between Natalie Atoke and Lewis Gordon asks, what is black existentialism and why is freedom such a central theme in that area of thought? <clears throat> How is black existential freedom different from other existential approaches, all of which avow commitments to freedom? The context of this conversation is the publication this month of Natalie's new book, Black Existential Freedom, published by Roman and Littlefield. Um, I've put some biographical details of Natalie and Lewis in the box below this video as well. I really hope you enjoy this event and please tune in for future ones. Now, Natalie, to kick things off, I got to tell you something. Uh, when I logged on, as you know, because you visited my home, you know, I'm always playing music. And so when I when I, I logged on for us to just kick, you know, to just get on for setting up the computer, I just put randomly, just say, play something. And would you believe what came up, came on was Billy Taylor's I wish I knew how it would feel to be free. To be free. Performed by Nina Simone. All right. Right. I was like, yo, the ancestors <laughs> in life, what's going on here? What's going on here? Okay. So I think that already says something. We're, we're, the, the, the ancestors approve. They approve. Ashe. So, Ashe. So I'm going to begin also by saying to you, Natalie, um, uh, Basically, Dua uh, Neter, felicitation, congratulations. Dua Neter is in Medu Neter. It's an ancient language uh, in East Africa. It's congratulating you. Your book comes out tomorrow, Black Existential Freedom. And I'm looking forward. I expect my copy to come in the mail tomorrow. And uh, I should say that I also have enjoyed teaching your work over the years. Uh, I'm teaching... I teach it in my, my mega course on global existentialism and on non-Western philosophy and a variety of others, Africana philosophy. And I got to tell you, the students just love, and they share the love I have both for your writing and for your thought, okay? And I know one of them is probably online, checking things out now, Ma, you know, Maura Thaidman. She just said, oh God, I love her writing. So I just figured I'd give you a little shout out there. Thank you. So, so to kick things off, those who pick up the book would see that I also wrote an endorsement of the book. And I'm just gonna read out loud my endorsement because I think it contextualizes things. And after I'm done, Natalie, I'd like you to, to kick things off and just said, you know, why did you write this book? And what are you trying, you know, what are you trying to say in it? And this endorsement says a lot about how this book had an impact on me. Okay, so here's what I wrote. And Folks who get the book will see it on the back. I wrote against the death fetishism, Eurocentrism, and de facto political conservatism of Afro-pessimism. Nathalie Atoke offers, through meticulous scholarship and poetic insight, the existential dimensions from the global perspective of Black political struggles to the practices of joy and pleasure in everyday life across the African diaspora, of Blackness as an affirmation of life. She exposes, quote, the banality of white supremacy, unquote, which attacks human agency, dignity, and freedom, and argues that the humanity of Black people extends beyond moral and political forms of resistance. It is, as Etoke beautifully demonstrates, and I emphasize demonstrates, 
in the lived reality of Black people's affirmation of life in contingency, in making meaning beyond the quagmire of despair. Black existential freedom reminds us that no better world can emerge without active thought for freedom. She counsels us to be inspired and learn from those who rose to the occasion of that responsibility and draw upon the resources of our creativity in every aspect of existence, which we should remember also means life. Yes, this book is at birth a classic work in Black existential thought. Read it, learn from it, and share it as I plan to far and wide. And I'm, and, and I'm not kidding. I plan to be teaching it you know, <laughs> next semester. So Natalie, the screen is yours. First of all, I would like to thank you for your support throughout the years. It means a lot to me. I would like to thank the philosopher and Anthony and everybody who signed up to listen to the conversation and participate to the conversation that we are having this afternoon. You could be anywhere in the world, but you chose to be here. So I'm extremely grateful for your presence. Um, why did I write this book? You know, it's a very interesting question. In many ways, I don't know where I read this, but someone says that somehow we keep on writing the same book over and over again. <laughs> um, I think I was looking at the ways in which we understand freedom, usually in political terms, but I was also grappling with this issue of dehumanization with regards to people of African descent whether they're from the diaspora or the continent. Because I think the ways in which we engage the question of freedom goes beyond you know, the legality, what I call the legality of freedom or the issue of rights. There's something about the legacy of subhumanity that we constantly have to wrestle with, but then at the same time, we have to decenter the white gaze we have to decenter epistemic violence and center on ourselves. And also, I was interested in, and I'm not sure if, I think you're the one who talked about this, Lewis, this idea of the inner lives of Black people, meaning oppression has been around for centuries, but people still exist and appear in the world. Yes, Fanon wrote that you know, the Black man has no ontological resistance in the eyes of the white men. But then at the same time, you see that there's this ontological subjectivity that manifests itself in, in the practices of everyday life. Of course, in academia these days, there is a conversation about Afro-pessimism um, that is very trendy, but I didn't really try to write a response to Afro-pessimism. I was just trying to problematize the ways in which if we look at black life solely through the lens of white supremacy or social death, in many ways we are, we are erasing and silencing the ways in which blackness has to do with this affirmation of life in the context of oppression for the sake of freedom. And the fact that maybe black freedom is not something that is given, it is fought for, yes, from this perspective of human rights, but also from this existential perspective in terms of you know, your humanity, how do you define yourself in your own terms? And how do you practice existence in the context of oppression? So you constantly have this tension there. And I think that's what I observed. I was, I don't know if it's a blessing. You know, I've been quote unquote black on three different continents. So- <laughs> So you're, so you're I, black, black, black. <laughs> I don't know. People talk about global blackness these days. I don't know what that means. But I know that I was born in Paris and I was raised in Cameroon. And that, you know, when I lived in Cameroon, my racial identity didn't, didn't matter because in Africa, everybody is black, therefore no one is. It doesn't mean that white supremacy is not present in terms of how our education system was shaped and how, you know, some of the education and the teaching that we get. But all I'm trying to say is, I see other people as human beings first. Fast forward, I moved to France. I, I'm 18 to go to college. That is when I become black, quote unquote. But what does that mean? It really has to do with becoming a minority 
and also the white gaze and also epistemic violence, this idea of constantly engaging the idea that the white world has of you, which has nothing to do with who you are. And I read Fanon in my early 20s. But fast forward, I moved to the U US. I discovered something else in terms of blackness in the context of America, but I also discovered this rich library with all these black thinkers who, was, who were talking about blackness, not just in terms of this antagonizing of yourself with the white world, but really constantly focusing on who you are, not from a narcissistic standpoint, but for, because you're trying to touch this freedom that at first seems so abstract and out of touch, but it's part of who you are, although you excluded from it. And I look at cultural productions to kind of look at it. So whether I'm talking about the spirituals, the spirituals is not just about God, it's about liberation and assessing your humanity, saying that you're a child of God when people say you're not. And then I look at the civil rights songs, or I look at how people talk about slavery in global terms, but I'm like, slavery, what does that mean? What happens when we shift the conversation and we talk about an individual going to an experience, an individual who at the time knew his name, knew who he was, was somebody's mother, was somebody's father, was somebody's sisters, has a language, but found himself or herself in the hold of that slave ship, is unable to communicate with other people, but then realize that, oh, all of us down here are Black. What does that mean? You know, so all those questions kind of inform my perspective, but I'm also interested in this question of the human, because I think what makes Black existentialism very unique is really this legacy of subhumanity and situation of despair and tragedy and ontological catastrophe that you constantly have to engage, not only from an existentialist standpoint, but the material conditions of your life. So when I look at the ways in which Black immigrants are treated, whether we're talking about Europe today or America today, what is there that make their exclusion unique? What is the problem with this idea of Blackness and being human in this world? So wow. how do we straddle that fence? And I'll stop right there. <laughs> well, you know, what you just said before I get to the next question made me think about uh, a few things. Uh, the first thing is uh, the point when you said minority, there's also a, a view of, uh, about minoritization. So for instance, if we think of South Africa, black people are the majority, but, but anti-black racism and white supremacy, right, at, at the level of power structure, creates a sense of being minoritized. The other thing I was thinking is, is something, uh, because as you know, we began with me using uh, two African languages to say hello and also to say blessings. And it's, it's really striking because in many African languages, and there's, there's, a, there's a Bavarian philosopher actually who talks about this in an interesting way. Uh, the word individual is uh, something that comes from a particular uh, metaphysics that comes out of Greek philosophy and Latin philosophy, or rather Roman philosophy. Uh, and and the, the individual was just the Roman way, the Latin way of saying basically usea, substance. But human communities are connected. We're actually individual. In other words, we're related. And in many African languages, a person is not a thing. A person is a relationship. And this comes out a lot in your work. And the other thing that was uh, I was thinking is that the Afro-pessimists completely distort what Fanon actually said, because it's just a phrase in the French, but he doesn't say that Black people lack ontological resistance. What he's really saying is because they, they confuse the title. You see, the title is Black skin, which is to be sealed in your skin, and white mass, which is the lie that many white people wear. And in that part of the analysis, he was talking about the lie. And the lie is many white people need to believe that black people have no ontological resistance. That's why he says, in the eyes of the, the white. But the eyes of black people among one another, we know we have a lot of ontological resistance, which you beautifully talk about in the book. So, you know, I, I, I just wanted to, to throw that in because it's a good segue for us to get to this part, right? Because 
right now, it's really shocking how this stuff has taken a form where there are people actually acting like the human was created by white people, which is just bizarre. Yeah. And yeah. They, yeah, but the thing, so, so, so why don't we start with that one? Because first of all, because why existentialism? And uh, and and that and connect that to the question of how we talk about this notion of the human and and that's a little distorted too, right? Because to say yes. the human is a very unnatural form of speech. So yeah, go, go I think it goes back to the type of epistemic framework we use to even analyze our own existence, because I can totally understand what the Afro pessimists are saying in the context of you know, human rights and citizenship. And, you know, because in the Western world, there are ways in which if something is not written and acknowledged by the powers that be, it does not exist. So coming from that perspective, you will see that this idea of struggle for black freedom and black humanity has been understood through that unique framework of, you know, rights. But we see that the issue is deeper than rights because you can be a citizen, an American citizen, you're still black. What becomes of your right in that moment? So you need to have another way of looking at who you are that goes beyond this dehumanization. And I also, also say in my work that you cannot dehumanize that which is not human. I know that sounds very basic, but you know, I always tell my students that you cannot dehumanize a chair. You cannot dehumanize, I don't know, uh, a door. So we need to reverse the paradigm to, to understand that the root of the humanization is humanization. So once you understand that you cannot dehumanize that which is not human, what conversation are we going to have at that point when it comes down to humanity? And I think that's where the confusion occurs because, and I understand this, question of human rights, but it's not enough. And thank God, historically, people of African descent understood who they were and still understand who they are outside of that framework. Because if we were only to define ourselves through the legal language that tells you that you're part of this world, we would not exist. <laughs> That's <laughs> where you can have uh, a certain kind of nihilistic approach to black humanity. Because if you only look at the ways in which we are mistreated by the powers that be, yes, we're not human. But again, is that the only way to look at oneself? And then historically, when you look at the life that these people have lived, you know they were way beyond their circumstances, although they were constantly engaging the struggle. And I think that's the tension I'm trying to address. And also the ways in which you have to define the value of your life although it is constantly being devalued. So that's what I started the book, bringing up George Floyd. I said, what's the point of talking about black existential freedom when you constantly bombarded with images that reminds you that you're not free? What do you do oh. with that? Well, that's a great way for us to get into something that would be useful for the audience. Uh, I mean, I talk about it often, but I'd love to hear you talk about it, which is, why Black existentialism and what is Black existentialism? Well, I will let you know, I always say that I'm not a philosopher. I wasn't trained as a philosopher. Uh, you're but, an excellent philosopher. But you don't have to be trained I, as a philosopher. I, I, I'm very grateful that, you know, I'm welcome in those spaces. Honestly, if I were to give you an honest response, um, Lewis, it's very simple. I always look at the ways in which black people of African descent have to exist in this world. I don't know why, it's an obsession of mine. Whether I'm talking about post-colonial colonial Africa or the diaspora, there's just something about the ways in which we become part of this world. We're part of it, but we're also excluded from it. You know, the ways in which, even when you think about trade, and, 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 and borders, even in the context of Africa, we live in a reality that we did not necessarily create. We engage in epistemic world that was not necessarily ours, but there we are, we have mm -hmm. to exist and we, we have to find a way to exist and be free. 
And racist, and then you have the human condition. Being human is hard. I don't mm -hmm. care what your racial background is. We are gonna die one day. <laughs> we are gonna experience illness, death, despair, anxiety. There are just certain things about the human condition that we all share. But I think racism is like the icing on, on the cake, like unnecessary suffering that you don't, you didn't choose. You know, you don't choose your skin color. You don't choose the historical and political circumstances under which you're born, but you're born here and you have to do something about it. So it's that's also, why I come to this it, idea of existence, you know, it's like, how do you appear in this world knowing that there is a struggle, there's a fight, you know, and it can be tiring. It can be, yeah. you, you, can, you can feel that it's, it's not fair, but it's just, <laughs> but you're here. What are you gonna do about it? So that's how yeah. I look at it. And I look at the history of, uh, people who were deported, people who were enslaved, people for whom hope unborn has died, but they were still hopeful. So I think there's something else about freedom that brought us here. But then at the same time, we're constantly engaging the materialistic, the material conditions of our lives that can bring us down in many ways, not because of our own doing, but because of this struggle you know, which is also political, philosophical, mm -hmm. economic. There's a whole, many issues or intersect and overlap. That's why I'm also very wary of this ontologizing of blackness, just talking about blackness. I think we also have to talk about the material conditions of our lives. Well, you know, um, um, several things. The first thing that came to mind is that one of the problems with that icing is that, you know, they have peed and crafted it, <laughs> right? But they are, but there are several other things too, you know. Um, you are, uh, I, when I say you're, you're also a philosopher, as you know, Natalie, I always say I'm also a philosopher. I don't think, you know, someone is better if they are a philosopher. It's just, you know, because you're an excellent literary theorist, filmmaker, many things, but you are also a philosopher. I mean, Wittgenstein was an engineer and a nurse and an architect. R Russell was a mathematician. Husserl was a mathematician. Fanon was a psychiatrist. William James is a psychiatrist, Ada Julia Cooper, she did literary theory, the list of people who are the greatest philosophers in, in history, physicians, all the way through William James, Carl Jaspers. You don't have to have a degree in philosophy to be an excellent philosopher. You have to bring excellent ideas and your ideas are excellent. So for me, that's and I, and all I just, that matters. And I realized that I didn't really answer your question. What is black existentialism? <sighs> to me, black existentialism means a lot of things, but if I were to use one sentence, it's hard to be human in the world that dehumanizes you. Oh. You know, what is humanity in black skin means? Mm -hmm. Because we know you have this legacy of subhumanity, but you still have to exist. When I think about black existentialism, I can also talk about certain thinkers that really inform my understanding. People like Du Bois, you know, and the idea of double consciousness. People mm -hmm. like Fanon, you know, particularly the lived experience of the Black, l'expérience vécue du noir, but then at the same time, this question of the human, because the last sentence in the, um, in Black Skin, White Man is, you know, to build the world of the you, this interrelationality inter that you're talking about, which even transcends Blackness. It's like, how do we create a world where my existence is there to build a world with you in relation with you. Because at the end of the day, some of the key issues in black existentialism is also this failure to connect sometimes with yourself if you internalize racism and also with the outside world, which really works at cutting off that connection, you know? So that, that is what I will say in the nutshell. And I think also, Haitian Creole, and I don't speak Haitian Creole, but I will never forget when I found out that in Haitian Creole, the word neg, N-E-G, so neg in, in French, does not mean black. It means man, it means human. And I was thinking these people had something that we lost because you know, in Haiti, you can be a negro blanc. You're just a human who happens to be white. So this idea that these people who were enslaved created a language where neg means human really turned my world upside down because I was thinking once you start thinking that way about that word, 
the condition of being human from that perspective, it really changes the conversation, I think. Sure, you know, to that, you know, one of the, one of the things I'd add to that, um, whenever I talk about uh, black existentialism, I usually point out too that, and, and I thought what you just said was beautiful, that really summarized it beautifully, is that it also resists reductionism. It usually talks about, for instance, there are multiple uh, challenges raised by the emergence of the category of blacks or, you know, because a lot of the people we call blacks were not historically black or the people we call white who were, they were not historically white, they became such. And so that led to the question of um, um, what does it mean to be human, which you're addressing. Obviously, with enslavement and colonialism, the question, what does it mean to be free? The third question, of course, is that a lot of science, philosophy, literature, in other words, the whole resources of how we communicate and try to think about the world, were rallied in support of dehumanization and unfreedom. So it creates a crisis of that, right? A crisis of justification. The next one is it raises the problem of redemption. Right. This connects to your first work of melancholia. The idea that um, that to, to to lie to us that our existence have no redemptive value whatsoever. But there's something else in black existentialism that's really cool that links to the question of freedom, and this is what a lot of Afro pessimists missed and a lot of critics miss. Uh, the existential critique is also a critique of ontology. When you ontologize people, you turn people into things. The whole point about humanity is to transcend being things. And there are others who talk about this, like the Japanese philosopher Kaiji Nishitani. You'll see it in Ali Shariati, in uh, you know the Persian or Iranian philosopher. You, it's, it's all over the place. You'll see it in a lot of African thought. And the argument is that ontology covers reality. Reality is not simply about things. It's more than that. And, uh, and I think that links a lot to the question of why freedom. I, I do want our, uh, because I see our audience is very anxious. I'd like them to get some questions, but there's something you'd like to say before Anthony begins to tap into the, to pose the questions to you? Just one last thing. What you said about commodification is very important. And I think that's something that sometimes um, get me a little weary when I think about how we engage the issue of identity today. You know, who you are, not in terms of the relationship you have with other people. It doesn't mean that the relationship is easy. There could be conflict, but how do you go about basing the relationship instead of just talking about who you are from this perspective that I think even commodifies you as a subject. You know, I think it's very important. And also this notion of freedom in my work, I talk about colonial freedom because I think we need to complicate the conversation about freedom because when the Western world is pondering over this issue of freedom and you have all these philosophers talking about freedom, you have other people who are not free. So in many ways, I think even the way we understand freedom, I talk about colonial freedom because you cannot address that freedom without discussing um, dispossession of land, uh, the genocide of Native Americans, the enslavement of people of African descent. So, but we have this idea that, you know, the Western narrative is self-redemptive. Eventually, yes, some people were excluded, but now they can become part of it. But I think it's much more complicated than that because the roots of that freedom are colonial, the colonial roots. So maybe we need to decolonize freedom to really come up with something else. And I think that's why Fanon is also very useful when it talks about identity, you know, what we need to create. And that's our I, stop right there. I agree with you wholeheartedly, right? And in fact, I often make the distinction between liberty and freedom. But uh, Anthony, Anthony, uh, I could remember some to add, but if so, we could, I think our question, there's so many questions that it'll be great if we take three at a time and see where we end up and don't don't worry natalie i'll i'll remember them so go ahead go <laughs> this was a conversation we had before we started about lewis's um, ability to juggle a number of questions and natalie's uncertainty whether she could but i mean i i think what, what what i'll do is just start with a couple of things that came up in the the chat a couple of simple things um 
So Vera asked, what does ontological resistance mean? So I think I'll put that to you first, Lewis, because I think it was you that was mainly talking about it. Do you want to start? And then if you want to pick up on it, Natalie, you can pick up. Oh, let, let's pick, let's have two more because that way the audience can learn from one another. Oh, okay, cool. So this was a phrase that uh, Maram put in the chat, which I thought was very interesting. It was, who are black people without the whites in our head? And I suppose you could read that however you want, internalization, um, sub subjectivization, racialization, et cetera. And then Jennifer was just picking up on um, the think of Fred Moten. I don't know if he's of interest to I either of you noting um, his idea about asserting subjectivity when historically objectified. So those are the three, just like um, whether there's anything in any of those that you'd like to pick up on. So, um, oh, okay. Well, I'll start with the first one just be and be very short. Uh, it can be elaborated elsewhere. But if we're going to talk about ontological resistance, we're talking about the question of everyday life. And Fanon is very explicit that, that all of the world, Black people live everyday life among one another perfectly fine. It is, that's one of the reasons why in a lot of our books, Natalie and, and I, in my recent book, begin with the experience of being Black people from Black countries. And we're able to do that perfectly well. And when, when we're in situations where there are white people trying to tell us that we're not people, uh, it's it's almost laughable to us. And so so the short answer is the problem when people try to think ontologically is they think it's complete. But the, the reality is that even on the conditions of enslavement, enslaved people were finding ways to live their humanity and they found ways to experience value, joy, and assert dignity. And we know that because it's by, by their actions that many of us are still here. But that's a, there's a longer answer to that. But the short answer is we are able to articulate lives for ourselves worth living. But Natalie may want to take over with some of the others. Just to add up to what you said, um, another way to talk about it is if, if you don't want to use the word ontological resistance, Sylvia Winter talk about ontological sovereignty. This idea that, you know, we have to move completely outside of uh, our present conception of the human. It goes back to um, what Lewis was trying to say, I think. And with regards to Morton, I'm familiar with that approach, but it also in my own work, <clears throat> I talk about <clears throat> active subjectivity versus passive subjectivity. So in my work, passive subjectivity, I think somebody in the, in the chat mentioned it, it's like, you know, living in white, with white people in your heads, basically. Defining yourself in the context of white supremacy and internalizing a degrading image of who you are. Not because it's your fault, but because you bombarded with this idea that you're lesser than. But then you have active subjectivity, which to me is the ways in which you resist, not necessarily because you're trying to challenge or dismantle white supremacy, but just like what um, Lewis just said, because you know you're a human being and you're going about your life, you know, on a regular basis. That's what I mean. So it's more active. The force, the external forces of oppression are still there. You're still confronting them, but it doesn't mean that you surrender or surrendering to them. Whereas, yeah. you know, in, in, in passive subjectivity, it's just, you just buy into that image and then you, you find yourself in a set, state of paralysis, which starts psychologically and internally you know yeah, so what the world tried to what the world tried to do to you is one thing but then what you do with what the world is trying to do to you is something else in other way in other words that's why i separate passive subjectivity from active subjectivity but they're not mutually exclusive you know yeah and you know and one of the things that's often overlooked is that narrative of ontological closure is a lie to make us think liberation and freedom are not possible. And the very fact that it's a lie already tells you that it's undermined with the assertion that it's complete. The other thing is, is it's very strange that we always make the neurotic stand for Black people. The, the neurotics are people who suffer a form of ego collapse through which they are not able to articulate their relationship to the world. And there are many Black people who don't have white people in our heads. We see white people out there. 
Well, we have in our heads our mothers, our fathers, our brothers, our sisters, our loved ones. And it's very strange that we always, there, there's a tendency, particularly in academic literature, to throw Black people always into the category of the pathological, the psychotic, the neurotic. But the fact of the matter is that most Black people spend a lot of our lives not wa walking around asking ourselves, are we white enough? We, spend, we don't even ask if we're Black enough. We ask stuff like, you know, are we going to get enough food today? How's our friends doing? How is, you know, how, how are our neighbors? Am I going to get a job? And we, we need to get rid of these very new, distorted, actually ultimately neurotic bourgeois ways of thinking about Blackness. But anyway, that's me just speaking out loud. Uh, are there some more? Did you want to say something, Natalie? Or just one thing, just... maybe I think Fanon talks about it and Baldwin also somewhere. There is a class component to it. I think it's Fanon in the last chapter of Pont Noir Mas Blanc. He talks about the fact that maybe the black bourgeois is the most alienated person because you're constantly engaging white spaces, white structures of thinking and the type of alienation that you constantly have to deal with, you know, put you in a very unique um, space. And I think you were talking about maybe working class, maybe the class component should also inform the way we have those conversations somehow. Who is yeah, constantly... maybe because I was poor. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Maybe because I was a poor kid, I was actually rich with a healthy, and my family, you know, I just, my, my family, my relatives, even in the Bronx growing up, we were running around trying to figure out if we could be like white people. We saw the beauty in one another. But anyway, I'm sorry. This is part of my uh, my editorial, but I'm sorry. Go ahead, Natalie. I just wanted to add that. Okay, Anthony. Okay, I'm I'm back. That that's a great format for the Q and A. A few questions, a little bit of back and forth, and then we'll move on. So anyway, there's been some really great questions coming in. I'll start at the top with Arubi, who asks: the notion of authenticity has been at the centre of existentialist thought in relation to freedom. How does the idea of authenticity fan out within, or fa no, fan out from Black existentialist freedom? Okay, can we get two more? <laughs> sure. Um, so the next two both both kind of link. It's from Lilian and Sunyata, and they relate to Afro-pessimism, which Lewis brought up at the beginning. So Lilian um, gives a little preamble about Fanon's The Damned of the Earth. There is no returning to some previous state of wholeness for a colonized people, and there is a becoming new in the decolonizing process, which involves taking forward and collectively working through that deep visceral pain of being overwritten. The question she then goes on to ask is, in what ways does Afro-pessimism fail to miss the mark in taking this, um, I'm not sure if she means fail to miss the mark or fails to hit them, anyway, um, you'll work it out, fail to miss the mark in this taking forward and working through, assuming that there's different ways in which people work through their histories, is this merely bad faith? Um, and then Sunyata's related question, is there any usefulness in Afro-pessimism? For, for instance, what about the idea that black people function solely, not entirely as slaves? Thanks so much. Okay, well, I will, well can I, I, I go the authenticity one? Yes, I will. I was about to say that. I will, I will talk about. The, I had a feeling. <laughs> I, I'll talk about the other ones, uh, the two other questions. Okay, well, when, let me. When we go to Afro pessimism, just, just even just the language. For instance, I noticed this shift in academia, and Lewis, you talked about, talked about it. You know, people talk about Black bodies these days. You know, I rather talk about Black people. And I think there is. Um, shift there in terms of understanding who you are once you start talking about black people instead of just talking about black bodies but i understand why the focus could be on black bodies because when you think about violence and police police brutality or how people respond to the physicality of the black being it's all about the body but then at the same time what happens when we shift the conversation and instead of talking about black people we just focus on the body because of the ways in which the body has been historically abused and mistreated. I think that's the question that I will have for the Afro pessimist. What are the what are the consequences of that epistemic shift 
what happens when we stop talking about black people but just talk about black bodies? Although I understand why there's the focus on the body in the context of oppression. And also in my work, we didn't really talk about that. I also talked about uh, the condition of queer people in Sub-Saharan Africa, specifically in Uganda and South Africa to also complicate this question of the human and the humanization because there are ways in which we have this tendency of focusing on the humanization in the context of white supremacy. But what happens when we look at how, the ways in which we also devalue each other or choose to exclude each other? And what are the epistemic or religious framework we use? So in the context of queer, uh, the brutalizing of queer subjects in Africa, I really focus on the influence of the evangelical far right in promoting homophobia in Africa and sponsoring uh, homophobia. I focus on also state-sponsored homophobia, but at the same time, I look at the backlash queer people have to endure when you also have the Western world, like Obama going to Senegal, and the first thing he talks about is give people gay rights and the backlash after he leaves, or also when he goes to Kenya. So also complicating the question about the humanization in that context, particularly pertaining to queer folks in sub-Saharan Africa. I just wanted to bring that up in the context of the conversation. But Lewis, I like to deal with authenticity. <laughs> Thank you, Natalie. Uh, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll be brief. I am one of those people who absolutely reject authenticity discourses. Authenticity discourses, uh, first of all, often have a tendency to make the person who's asserting authenticity, make themselves the standard of authenticity and close off others. A human being is basically not a complete notion, but an open possibility. But the problem is with authenticity is that what one finds is that many people are never authentic enough. It's a nowhere discourse that leads people into a form of self-asserted purity through which they ultimately begin to dominate others. And I could also put my cards on the table. I see humanity as fundamentally actually queer, but that what goes on is an, an, an ongoing project to de-queer or to close off the possibilities of humanity in such a way that they could fit into these authenticity paradigms. Because if you find all the homophobic and anti this and anti that stuff, not only in Africa, but across the Caribbean and other places, they all, they, they all ultimately come down to, to some notion that what, what to be an authentic African or an authentic Caribbean or is to be something that's a complete stereotype. The truth of the matter is many of us don't know what in the world we are until we live and we realize those possibilities. And this is a crucial element that's linked into understanding freedom. And, and, and just very briefly in terms of the, the, the other question in terms of the Afro-pessimists, um, their narrative buys into this kind of ontological reductionism in which one deals with an individual in such a way that the individual eventually becomes like a god. So it becomes, if I can't have my freedom, it's because freedom is impossible, which is BS. The reality is nobody can have their freedom by themselves. If that whole point we were saying before about a relational understanding of people means that one has to understand how power works and power is fundamentally political. So this means then if we're gonna deal with a political problem such as colonialism, anti-black racism, all the way through even the way we're talking about the effort to de-queer humanity, we're gonna to have to develop political solutions to them. And I don't see how they work through dealing with notions of ontological closure. And the moment we have openness, it patently begins to transcend the ontological. But anyway, that's getting more into metaphysics, but, uh, but I'll leave it at that. Just to add on authenticity, you also have to think about the ways in which, at least in post-colonial Sub-Saharan Af Sub Africa, the idea of authenticity has been used and abused in the context of oppression and dictatorship. So you have uh, Mobutu Sese Seko, in the, what we call now the DRC, but what used to be called Zaire. Remember, it changed, it, it, it created a situation where people had to change their names to reject Christians' names. You have to take um, native names. Um, it changed the name of the country, it made that up. 
we changed the name of the currency, everything was Zaire, Zaire, and it was supposed to be authentic, about authenticity and about being African. So when people would bring up conversation about democracy, your freedom, we would say, no, nous sommes des Africains, nous croyons aux chefs, we are Africans, we believe in, believe in chiefs. So there are also ways in which this language about authenticity is very repressive and reactionary in the uh, African context. And in the context of their subjectivity, people would claim the Christian narrative and the African identity discourse. But if you really think about it, you know, Christianity, I mean, we're dealing with the legacy of colonial sodomy laws, whether we're talking about the Caribbean or Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, African people never sat down somewhere to decide that, you know, to be gay was a crime. So we don't even understand, understand the ways in which we keep the repressive legacy of colonialism and keep it alive in the name of identity, African identity or Christianity pertaining to queer folks. But you see that all of that has to do with repressing freedom and dehumanizing other people and disciplining and controlling queer bodies in the context of a post-colonial crisis. So the queer subject becomes a scapegoat. I do not understand why people who cannot have jobs, countries where you have civil wars, where the elite is corrupt, all those people come together to chastise the gay and to come up with more repressive bills. So in a very strange and pragmatic kind of way, homophobia creates a connection and a link in the context of nationalism. And all of that is grounded on some type of discourse regarding authenticity and African identity. You're here. <laughs> well, and again, another another great cluster of questions and answers. So I think we'll we'll get going with our final cluster, and that will see us through to the hour. So, um, great questions, nice and short, perfect. So this is from Kevin. Um, it's addressed to Natalie, um, but obviously Lewis may well have. Um, his own take on it. Um, I wonder if you could talk a bit more about your critique of, of legal language and what speaking of, quote, the legality of freedom allows us to see, think, or do differently. Second question is from Naomi. Um, do you want to say anything about whether white people ought to try to see ourselves through the black gaze? Um, and um, then there's Bellero who asks, any thoughts on violence being used in order for black people to secure their freedoms? So um, over to you, Natalie. <laughs> okay, Lewis, I will let you deal with violence. <laughs> but I have to say, um, you know, I, I'm not sure when it comes down to the ways in which we have to engage this idea of blackness per se in the, I think the legality of language, you know, everything starts with language. We talk about epistemic violence. There are ways in which we've been constructed in the Western narrative to justify oppression and subjugation, you know, and to me, what I call the legality of language is the ways in, I'm really focusing about, even think about the treaties that Native Americans had to sign, quote unquote, to give up their lands. Do they know what they were signing? Did, we, did they ask for their agreement or negotiation? But you have this idea that once something is in writing, and there's just something about the legality of that language that can support and justify all any kinds of wrongdoing. And I think that's the problem. I mean, look, think about the Berlin Conference in 1884. You didn't have a single African person sitting around that table, but people made up, came up with decisions and they signed some type of paperwork that gave them the right to balkanize Africa. Germany loses World War I. The same people decide that, well, Germany has to give up their colonies. So they give Togo and Cameroon I mean, Cameroon to the French and the British. And Cameroon technically was never a colonization, but a protectorate against the legality of language. What difference does that make for the Cameroonian person, whether it's a colony or it's a protectorate? So I think there are ways in which we lose language, even the language about crime against humanity. I always talk about 
discuss that with my students. Even the word genocide, there's a language regarding crime against humanity and genocide that comes out of the Holocaust and World War II. Does that mean that forms of genocide did not occur before or crime wasn't committed against the human before? And Cesar asked that question in uh, Discourse on Colonialism. Are we, he said, are we talking about crime against men or crime against the white men? And people accuse him of being anti-Semitic. No, what he was trying to say that the issue is not really the wording, is the recognition you get. So once your recognition, the recognition of your suffering is acknowledged within a certain kind of framework, there is reparation. There is a certain kind of acknowledge, acknowledgement that comes out of that, what I call the legality of freedom of legal language. Whereas you can talk about the Native Americans, you can talk about the Africans, you can talk about Armenians. We know there are a lot of genocides that occurred before, but the difference is the lack of recognition. And that's what I, I will stop right there. Yeah, the, t the term genocide came from Raphael Limkin when he was talking, when he was analyzing the Armenian situation. He was a Polish Jew and he didn't expect it to actually be a situation that would come upon him. And he did give a, a rather great gift by naming the phenomenon because one of the reasons Lemkin did it was when he was studying international law, international law in his times was basically this, that a country could do whatever it wants to its people. As long as a country is doing it to its own pe people within its jurisdiction, it was legal. And Lemkin knew that was ridiculous. So he, he lobbied to actually uh, push the idea of a crime against humanity in terms of genocide. But in terms of law, I, I to, because we have little time, I encourage the uh, audience to look up the, this word, law fear, law fear. It's the use of law as war. And this is very crucial because that's what the right is doing all across the world. This is exactly what's happening in the Supreme Court of the United States right now. It's exactly what's being done to, to disenfranchise black votes. It's the use of law as a form of war. And this is gets into more complicated question about how to make law accountable to something beyond the idea of mere force. In terms of the question of uh, um, the black gaze, the truth is, this is what Fedon noticed. A lot of people miss when he said black skin, white mass. They thought he was talking about black people wearing white masks, but he wasn't. His argument is that white supremacy is white people wearing a mask, the mask of supremacy. It's a fraud. It's a lie. In other words, there's something ridiculous in any human being saying I'm intrinsically superior to any other human being. And so whenever black people, there's a reason why black people were lynched, killed, all kind, I mean, other kinds of kill, things done for looking into the eyes of whites, because in those eyes is truth. It's, it reveals the fraud, the lie of white supremacy. So this is one of the reasons why black consciousness, the fear of black consciousness, why there are people fighting against critical race theory and all of these things, is they're fighting against truth. And truth, as you know, is linked to reality. So one of the biggest fears, and not only in American society, but in, in any society that is conditioned by white supremacy, is that the society is built upon a lie. And in terms of violence, this issue of violence always comes up. But, you know, there's a double standard on violence. You know, Black people are always being asked to be nonviolent for things that white people at the snap of a finger would use violence for. White people don't stand up for their indignity. But the thing that we have to bear in mind is that colonialism, racism are ongoing systems of violence. And the problem is if you don't question those systems, if you don't challenge them, then you're complicit with violence. The, 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 the problem is that when you stand up against those systems, you are the one called violence because that system is treated as legitimate. So what Fanon pointed out, and I agree with him, is it's a waste of time to demonstrate you're nonviolent. What you should do is be actional, do something about the violence. Otherwise, violence, dehumanization will continue. But there's a lot more to say on this, but I know we have a limited time. Okay. Just I'd like to add a footnote on violence, because again, as I said before, sarcastic, sarcastic, sarcastically, I've been Black on two different con uh, continents. So when I think about violence, I just don't think about white violence versus against Black bodies. I think about post-colonial violence and dictatorship. 
the type of violence African dictators inflicted on their own people to repress freedom and the lack of accountability as well. And then I think about coup d'etat that keeps on happening in the, you know, in Burkina Faso, in Mali, Guinea, et cetera. And the ways in which, at least from the sub-Saharan post-colonial context, the question of violence in relation to freedom is, uh, is very complicated because at first the people are always happy to see the dictator being removed or disappear. But then they realize that you have this mili military police state that is also very repressive. And then you have an oligarchy and the creation of a caste system that is also very oppressive. So, and in the context of Sub-Saharan Africa, and I'm not talking about the nationalist struggle with people like Amika Cabral or what happened in Algeria with the FLN. I'm not talking about that historical period. I'm talking about now the role that violence plays in the context of freedom and oppression in Africa. It's very complicated because it's like shifting from one oppressive government to another and what happens when military are in power, but they are the one who can use the violence and they use it in the name of the people. But do they actually free the people? Do they create the condition of freedom? It's, it's complicated. That's why I have a, but I agree with Lewis. I don't get, you know, the moral argument about violence is just ridiculous to me. I think that's a way of silencing black freedom because people have moral conversation about violence only when oppressed people want to free themselves. But when they want to take over some of their countries because of oil, they even come up with fictitious wars, you know, but they create a narrative around it because they have the power to create that narrative. So it's a lie and it is also a form of bad faith. But I always say that history, at least from the Western perspective, is built on a lie that becomes the truth only because of violence, epistemic violence, physical violence, and the fact that if you're trying to challenge it, they will try to repress it, and that's it. So we're living a lie, but that lie becomes the truth because of violence. And I think that's, that's the problem we have to deal with. 